Well, good evening. It's uh, good to be with you. I hope that you're with us tonight. We uh, we did announce Sunday, and I meant to put it on Facebook, but it's been kind of a hectic week, that we are uh, going to start meeting at 6 on Wednesday night. Uh, so we're going to continue to look at the book of the Revelation. And uh, like I say, I hope that you'll be with us. If not, maybe you can watch this video a little later. Uh, but it is... Uh, six o'clock on Wednesday night, and so we're going to uh, going to look at this. Um, well, continue to look at chapter six. We looked at the first eight verses last time, and we're going to be looking at just three verses tonight. We looked at the first four seals. Uh, we saw that the the Lamb of God, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, received the book and the scroll really that was sealed and we saw the he was the one worthy to open the seals and we saw those first four seals opened in what we call sometimes the uh the four horsemen of the apocalypse the um the white horse and the black horse and the red horse and the greenish ghoulish pale horse and what that brought with them and tonight we'll look at some more that 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 brings with them as we look at verses 9 through 11 so if you have your bible uh take god's word and look at the the book of the revelation in chapter 6 and we'll begin reading with verse 9 and when he had opened the fifth seal I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We pray that you would help us, Lord, through your Holy Spirit to rightly divide it. Thank you for this time, and we ask that you would be glorified as we study your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, some of you may have heard uh, today, and we hope that you are, uh, everybody is still okay with the, uh, the weather that is going on. Uh, some of you may have heard today that it's a first alert weather day. There is a storm or multiple storms that are happening across our area, and because of that, there are warnings that go out to help you prepare so that you can avoid uh, if possible, uh, the storms, not that you can, uh, you can't keep the storm from coming, but you can be in a safe place. You can uh, be where you need to be to avoid the damage uh, that comes from the storm. And I want to think about that as we look at these verses. We see here, uh, some think maybe a, a different story, one hard to uh, interpret, and how do we pray this kind of a prayer, uh, but let's look at it together. As first, we see the witnesses. The witnesses are those saints who are, the Bible says, under the altar. It doesn't tell us which altar. It doesn't describe an altar in heaven, but that's the way John sees it here, is these who are gathered under the altar. These are the ones who have been killed during, martyred, really, during these first four seals that we looked at in, um, in the first eight verses of Revelation chapter 6, the false peace and the, the war and the famine and the disease and death, these are those Christians who were killed during that time. And we can see in our time, I believe, that points to uh, the time of the tribulation, we can see it getting more and more that way. Um, 
20 years ago even, uh, you would not have imagined that you could be put in jail for going to church. And yet they've tried that in some places, even in the United States. One pastor in particular in Canada has been arrested because they met and uh, didn't follow the guidelines for uh, wearing masks or something. And the, the county of Los Angeles has been um, trying to stop John MacArthur and Grace Community Church from meeting um, threatened to take away their parking lot that they had leased from the county. Um, I heard a video the other day of John MacArthur telling this that the county um, said they were going to set up a homeless shelter in the parking lot of their church and dump all these homeless people in their parking lot as as though that would you know deter the church from showing up and John MacArthur said, that is great. We have a seminary full of students who will be able to share Christ with all these people. Bring them, bring them on. And of course they didn't. Uh, so we can see in our own country how, um, how this could easily happen, the persecution of the church. We've lived over the last, well, in my lifetime, 50 plus years of a time of... Um, non-persecution even to some extent where the church was thought of as a, a good thing during my parents lifetime especially around the World War II area the 50s and the 60s the church was thought of as a good thing and after the 60s it it was not really thought of as a good thing we need to get up to date and um, the it has gotten worse uh, and worse and I believe Jesus says it, it will get worse. In Matthew chapter 24, he told the disciples, the time is coming when they will deliver you up and you'll be afflicted and they'll kill you and you shall be hated by all nations for my sake. It will be a worldwide persecution and we, you could easily see how that could happen today with the, the legislation they're trying to pass to legalize sin and once you legalize sin if you preach against sin then you'll be um you'll be arrested i believe for hate speech for preaching the gospel and i could see that happening in our lifetime uh, jesus says in john's gospel that the time is coming when they will unsynagogue you he told the jews they'll throw you out of the synagogue which was a terrible reality for the jewish people the synagogue was more than a church it was the civic center it was the the community center it was where they where their life happened and jesus said the time is coming that they'll throw you out of the synagogue and whoever kills you will do it and think they're doing god a favor they'll think they'll be doing god's work by getting rid of these narrow-minded bigoted christians there'll be many people saved during this time of the tribulation that's why there are these under the altar in revelation chapter 7 after the 144 witnesses share the gospel the john says he sees a great multitude which no man could number of every nation and kindred and people and tongues will stand before the throne and all of them clothed in white robes the gospel will be preached jesus says in matthew 24 throughout the whole world during this period and um, you'll have in the next chapter, we'll see the, the 144,000 Jews who will be evangelists preaching Christ, the two prophets in Revelation 11 that will come and preach and be killed and be raised from the dead and uh, ascended really back into heaven, chapter 11 tells us. Uh, in chapter 14, you have the angels sharing the message from the skies. And because of all that, you will have many people who come to Christ during the tribulation period, and some of those will be killed. The Bible says here in verse 9, they were killed because of the word of God and the witness of God. They were killed. Um, again, the Bible doesn't tell us what altar this is. It, it sounds similar to the altar of incense because the altar of incense symbolized the prayers of the people and 
Um, this passage talks about the people um, offering a prayer uh, to God, and we'll talk about that um, in just a minute. But they were slain because of the word of God and because of the witness of God, because they held on to their testimony. They wouldn't give up. Uh, it's reminded of the old uh, Southern Gospel song they, about the three Hebrew children. They wouldn't bow. They wouldn't bend. They wouldn't burn. And that's the way these saints were, although they were killed, as the three Hebrew children said, to Nebuchadnezzar, we believe our God's able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we're still not going to do what you want us to do. We're going to be faithful, and these were faithful. Uh, some believe that these saints are these the people who are Christians uh, are sort of saved by works, that they have to die in order to be saved, and I don't believe that. I believe that they are, because they are saved, they will believe till the death, just like we do. Those who are Christ will be Christ and will remain faithful uh, to the end. They're the word of God and the witness of God. And that's what Christians have always supposed to believe and supposed to do. Uh, one of the best examples of that in Acts chapter 4 where Peter and John went about preaching and they uh, healed the man at the beautiful gate at the temple uh, there in Jerusalem. And they called them in and said, hey, you're not supposed to, to do that. Don't preach in this name anymore. Don't spread this message here. And Peter said, this is the only message there is. The only message there is, there is neither is there salvation in any other. There's salvation in no other name. No other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved except Jesus. So that's the word of God. They believed the word of God as Peter and John did. And then the Bible tells us those who saw Peter and John in Acts chapter 4 again. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled, and they took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. So they had both the word of God and the witness of God. And that's what these tribulation saints have. And these, when the fifth seal was opened that John sees under the altar, those who have been martyred for their faith. So we see the witnesses. Secondly, the wail, I call it. The Bible says in verse 10, they cried with a loud voice. The word for cried is more than just a, a prayer, but a cry of desperation, a cry of despair. It's like the same word is used for the demons who cried out when Jesus came to cast them out. What do we have to do with you, Jesus, thou son of David? Like the two blind men who called out to Jesus in Matthew chapter 8, uh, I mean Matthew chapter 9, and again another blind man in Matthew chapter 20. They cried after Jesus, have mercy on us, son of David, or son of God. Uh, like the father who cried for Jesus to heal his daughter. Jesus said, according to your faith, be it unto you. If you only have faith, all things are possible to you. And he said, Lord, I, I believe, but help my unbelief. Help me. The same word that describes the mob in Jerusalem who cried out, crucify him, about Jesus. It's like, Jesus in John chapter 7 that great day of the feast Jesus was in the temple and he said if any man thirst let him come to me it's a, a cry these witnesses under the altar cried with a loud voice how long O oh Lord how long 
God is a God of mercy, but their prayer is for God's judgment. And there's both in the, well, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Nahum describes in chapter 1, describes God this way. God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dried up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him and the hills melt and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein, who can stand before his indignation and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. What a a terrible picture, an awesome picture of the God of judgment. But Nahum tempers that with a verse a few months ago I told you would be a good verse to remember. We see the indignation and the vengeance and the justice and judgment of God. But Nahum says in verse 7, the Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those that trust in him. So we see God's judgment, God's wrath, but we see God's mercy and judgment. And these who have been martyred cry out to God, when will the judgment part come? Even in the New Testament, it's not just as some people think. The God of the Old Testament is the mean God and the God in the New Testament is the nice, sweet God. Uh, Jesus is, uh, I like him better because he's meek and mild. Uh, the New Testament tells us, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says, says the Lord. And again in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30, and it's a quote from Deuteronomy 32, I believe it is, uh, for we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. God is a God of judgment. And this is a prayer for that judgment. Should we pray that way? Vance Havner told a story about a man in his church in one of his early pastorates. And he had been preaching, apparently, on hell. And the, the man told uh, Vance Havner, he said, I don't like all these messages on hell. Why don't you preach about the meek and lowly Jesus? And Vance Havner told him, most of the information I got about hell, I got from the meek and lowly Jesus. So there's no difference with God. There is judgment. There is wrath. There is vengeance, the Bible says. But there is mercy. And I think we should pray for, well, Jesus said he taught us to pray our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, if we're praying for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, something's going to have to change. There will have to be major changes, and if we pray for God's kingdom to come, we're reading about what's happening when God's kingdom comes. There's going to be judgment. There's going to be wrath. There's going to be vengeance. And it is a, a terrible picture. In the Old Testament, these, uh, well, in the Psalms especially, David, um, David prays that God would come and judge his enemies. The, the uh, theologian word for, uh, for that is the imprecatory Psalms that is it right for a Christian to pray, God, get rid of my enemies? 
Uh, and some of the ones in, well, in Psalm chapter 7 and verse 6. Arise, O Lord, in thy anger. Lift up thyself because of the rage of mine enemies and awake for me to the judgment that thou hast commanded. And in Psalm 55, let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. That's what the saints are praying under the altar for judgment to come. Jehoshaphat was the king of the southern kingdom of Judah and he was faced with, well, the descendants of Lot and the descendants of Esau, Moab and Ammon and Mount Seir, the Bible says. And there was a great company that came against them. They were facing uh, just a few hundred against a few thousand. And Jehoshaphat prayed to God. And in his prayer, he said, Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are on you. We are trusting you, Jehoshaphat said. That would be a, a great prayer for some of our elected officials to pray. Lord, we are facing an enemy, and we don't know what to do, but we're trusting you. Our eyes are upon you. We don't have the strength to do it, and we couldn't do it if we knew what we were to do, but we're trusting you. Our eyes are on you. What a marvelous prayer. They prayed to God that he would come, that he would really set up his kingdom, that he would judge the wicked, that he would make things right. And the reason they appeal to him, because he is holy and true. The God who is separate from all others, and he is true, which makes him separate from all others. He is the only right one. There's not there's not a lot of different gods. There's not a lot of different ways to God. There's one way to God, and it's the one who's worthy to open the book, the one who's worthy to loose the seals, the one who is praised around the throne. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, Paul said to Timothy. The holy and true God, God is the only one who can judge sin and punish it accordingly. And so we see the witnesses under the altar. We see the cry, the wail from them that God would come and make things right. And then thirdly, we see the waiting. God did hear their prayer. He would answer their prayer, but the answer for now is to wait. While waiting, God provides a gift. It says that in verse 11 that white robes were given unto them. Uh, to every one of them, uh, the Bible talks about robes of righteousness and Sardis, those who had not defiled their garments, would be given white robes uh, in Revelation 7 as we read a while ago that throng around the throne of God were given white raiment the final robes white robes are given in Revelation 19 that speaks of purity the word for robe here uh, and I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce this word. In the Greek, it looks like stole to me, S-T-O-L-E. But it represents a garment that goes all the way down to the feet. Completely covered. These tribulation saints who suffered persecution and were killed are now completely covered in the righteousness of God. That's what the robes are. Those white robes are 
really not white, but pure the word is. Light, it's a covering, I believe, as Adam and Eve had a covering in the garden and they were naked and not ashamed because they were covered with the glory of God. And I believe in heaven we'll be covered with the glory of God because we'll be praising him. John represents that as a, a robe, a white robe of righteousness that God gives us. And it's not our righteousness, it's Christ's righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 again. For he, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We sing a song in our church sometimes. The solid rock, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. We have to have a robe, and it's a gift from God, that robe of righteousness. And then he gives them not only a gift, but a guarantee. His word, delay is not denial. I hear your prayer, and your prayer will be answered, but now it's wait. Your fellow servants or others who, other Christians who are in the tribulation, some, and I believe some will, survive the tribulation period and, and go into the kingdom. But some others, their brethren, probably references those who will be martyred during the tribulation period. Either way, whether they made it through the next three and a half years or whether they made it all the way through the kingdom, they would soon be together. The Bible says in a little time, the Greek word micros, a little time, you'll need to rest and wait for the promise of God's word. Sometimes it's hard to wait when things don't get answered maybe the way we thought they would or in the time that we thought they would. John the Baptist found it hard to wait when he was in prison, Matthew chapter 11 tells us. Vance Havner said, it's one thing to stand in Jordan and give it, it's another to be in jail and take it. He was in prison and the one who had stood in Jordan and proclaimed, this is the Lamb of God that takes, the sin of the, takes away the sin of the world. When he was in jail, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 11, that he called two of his disciples and they came and he sent those two disciples to Jesus and they said, are you really the one that should come or do we need to look for somebody else? And Jesus said, Go back and tell John the things that you've heard and seen. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. This last beatitude maybe in Matthew's gospel. Blessed is the person who doesn't lose it because God doesn't answer in the time frame that they thought he should. Jesus says to John the Baptist's disciples, go back and tell John I'm running on schedule. Everything's going according to plan. Even these under the altar, God says to them, everything is going on schedule. I'm going to take care of it. It's all going to be handled. You just rest and wait on me. There's the witness or the witnesses under the altar. Their cry for God to come and judgment to set things right 
and he's the only one who can make things right. But there is a, a wait, a not yet. It's coming, which is a frightful thing to think about. Judgment is coming. Death is coming. Destruction is coming. And that's why we need to not only be prepared ourselves, but we need to warn others. Like today, we talked about a little earlier. Today, if you watch Channel 6, as I typically do, was a first alert weather day, and still is. And we have people watching. We have people sharing the news. There's possibility of damaging storms and winds coming, and you need to be on the lookout, and you need to be in a safe place. The book of Revelation tells us there's a storm coming. And our job is to be in the safe place, to be in Christ. And then we should be, every day should be a first alert day. We should be alerting and sharing with people the good news of the gospel so they will not go through this judgment that is to come, that he will keep us from. I hope you're in a safe place for the storms tonight and for the storm that is to come. The only way to do that is for you to be in Christ, to receive him as Lord. The Bible says if you'll confess Jesus as Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you can be saved. And those verses go on to say, and whosoever does that, will be saved. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now is the day. Today is the day of salvation. Would you receive him as Lord today? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this warning that we have that judgment is coming one day. Help us to warn those who don't know you that they would trust you as Lord and Savior. Help us to make every day a first alert day to share the good news that you came, that you died, that you rose again so that we could be made the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen.